able to design this controller to control that output if this one's not working? Because that's all we've done the whole class, is figure out how to design controllers. If so he's sneaking up here, he's going to drop it in there now. I know I didn't notice, but um, any case. <laughs> All right, so you've got, um, that's what the whole class has been based on, right? You take this, you have one input, one output, you design this controller to control that output using that transfer function. And you can do the same thing here, right? You can design this controller to control that output, assuming this thing's not used. So we know how to do this. The problem is we don't know how to do it such that if we turn them on at the same time, they, they're guaranteed to work or they might work well. That's what we don't know how to do, okay? All right, so my, the argument here is if this controller is turned off, then the transfer function between u1 and y1 is just going to be that transfer function because this path doesn't exist, and that's exactly what we want. And that's exactly how we design the controller. Okay, but if that's not the case, then, right, so that's the point, that's the point I make here. So if this controller is not non-zero, meaning it's, something other than zero, <laughs> kind of redundant, okay, um, then w you get a different situation here. So first of all, this is, I'm not going to keep going back to the other slide because you get mad if I do that, so you're just going to have to bear with me. So if you look at what you, so what, we're using U2 to control Y2. So U2 equals the controller transfer function GC2 times the air E2, and that's the air, right? Just the set point for that output minus the output itself, okay. To make life simple, let's just say we're not changing the set point at this point. So, right, deviation variable, that means that thing is zero. And then you get this here. Okay? So that's the first equation. The, my point is, where I'm trying to go with this is I'm going to show you that if the other controller's turned on, the effective transfer function between U1 and Y1 is not that. It's something much more complex. Okay? And that's where we have the problem. Okay, so there's what U2 is. Now, here's the expression for Y2 just the process dynamics here, right? U1 and Y1 both affect Y2 through these transfer functions. And now I can take this for U2 here, this expression, plug it in right there, and solve for Y2 in terms of U1, right? It's not, it's not hard. Plug it in, pull the Y2 over here, divide, get that, okay? All right, and here's the expression for Y1 now. Okay. Just same as here, except it's for Y1. So Y1 affected by both inputs through these two transfer functions. Um, so now, let's see, what did I do here? Hmm. I seem to be befuddled. That's all right, Swan. I have to admit, I looked at these notes a long time ago. We're going to sit here until I get it, though. Just relax. All right, U1 is still there, so I must substitute. So I've eliminated U2. I'm trying to figure out how did I eliminate U2 here? Oh. Oh, okay. Sorry. <coughs> this is why you tend to want to look at the notes like the night before, because these little nuanced things you don't remember, like if you looked at it two weeks earlier. But I got it now. All right. So there's U2. So there's U2 as a function of Y2. I want to eliminate U2. So I'm going to take U2, eliminate it through this equation, and the Y2 there is, is expressed right there. So if I take U2 equal minus GC2 times this big thing, okay, and plug it in right here for U2, then I'll get an expression that only involves Y1 and U1, and that's what it is, okay? And you see, it's what you wish it was, which is just that, that's the part you want, right? Because that's what you designed the controller for using. And then you've got this whole other thing. This whole other thing involves these other two transfer functions that you ignore in the controller design. It also involves the other controller. It's basically, I'm gonna switch back it, of course, uh, <laughs> I haven't got it plugged in. Um, it represents what is the effective transfer function between U1 and Y1 if this controller is turned on. It's that thing 
and then it's a whole other added thing that has to do with this path I've showed you. It involves that transfer function, that transfer function, that transfer function. Um, all right, so the question is, is this, is this a problem? Well, first thing it tells you is that these controllers are not independent of each other. Right, that's one thing we'd like to do in engineering design. If we do two separate designs, the optimal situation is they're totally independent of each other. Like you do A, then you do B, and you put A and B together, and it's guaranteed to work just like you want. Right? That's not the case here. Remember feed-forward control? We design a feedback control and a feed-forward control. They're totally independent of each other. You put them together, they'll work. There's no question. But in this case, no guarantees, right? Because the, the, this transfer function here is, is affected by the GC2. And the, so these two controllers are not independent of each other. And you can't design them to be independent of each other. Or probably put more accurately, if you design them to be independent of each other, there's no guarantee they'll work when you put them together. Okay? All right, so if we look at this, we see there's the part that we like. All right, that we do design on and the part that, that we don't like. And so in some sense, Y1 is affected both by this, you know, so the, the relationship between U1 and Y1 has two parts, this part and this part. If this part dominates, you'll be okay. But if, if this part is, is at least as close as this or actually dominates, you're going to be in trouble. So somehow we're trying to find a way such that we can ensure that this thing will be the dominant term and this, this will be kind of negligible. Okay, so that's, that's really the focus of the lecture next time. But here gives you, this gives you a little exa uh, example of what can happen. So this is taken directly out of the book. So this is a model, simple model for a, tra for a distillation column. So we've got two outputs we want to control, distillate and bottoms composition. We have two things we can manipulate, reflux, steam duty to a reboiler. And someone has built transfer function models relating these two inputs to these two outputs. You, you would not, hopefully you can understand, you would not do this by writing out mass and energy balances on the column. Okay, how would you do this? You'd do, you'd do process or system identification, right? You would change the reflux, you'd observe the changes in distillate and bottoms composition, you'd fit a first order plus time delay model to the data. Okay, so these are, this is not from first principles. All right, so, you know, dynamics are certainly more complex than this, but apparently you could capture the dominant dynamics just with these first order plus time delay transfer functions. And so, now the idea is I'm going to use the reflux to control the distillate and steam to control the bottoms for reasons I already explained. They're physically close to each other. So that means I'm going to design a controller for this pair, reflux distillate, using that transfer function. And for the other controller, which is steam to control bottoms composition, I'm going to use that transfer function. Okay? And I'm just going to pretend like these don't even exist at this point. Okay? And so you can use a variety, right? This force order plus time delay. We know several methods to design controllers for that. At this point, I'm just telling you this is what they came up with in the book. So they came up with <laughs> PID or PI controller tuning parameters. That's for the first pair. That's for the second pair. Okay? And so... What's shown here is two different situations. So you're plotting, so, some, so somebody simulated this in like Simulink. First of all, they simulated each controller by itself. So test this controller with this one off, test that controller with this, the other one off. That should work, because that's how you did the design, right? The design's supposed to work for each of them individually. And so for example, for distillate composition, um, it's not shown here, but there was a set point change from zero to one at time equals zero, and this is the response. So there's a time delay there, obviously, but it gets up pretty quickly, no overshoot, pretty good. Okay? Same thing for the bottoms composition. You look at that with the distillate controller turned off, set point change at zero, going up to one, a little bit slower, a little bit longer time delay, but you know, it gets there and does okay. okay. The d so the, bl the solid lines are each controller by itself with the other controller turned off, the dash lines with both controllers on at the same time. Okay. So what did you do? At time zero, you increase this and this, both set points, to one. And you can see now the controllers cycle. They, they oscillate. Okay. So this is a problem, right? Because both these controllers look really nice by themselves, and, but not so nice when they're together. And at this point, you have no idea if this is going to be a problem or not. Now, if this actually happened to you, if you were in a plant and this happened, um, the most obvious thing you do is to kind of what's called detune the controller. So if you were to 
build these two controllers. They both work well by themselves. You turn them both on, they do this. You like the controller. This is the inter this, these controllers interacting with each other. Okay? That's the result of these transfer functions here that you neglected on the, on the off diagonal. So if you saw this, the simplest thing would be to detune the controller. When somebody says detune the controller, they usually mean turn the gain down. Like turn that gain down to 0.4 and turn that gain down to like 0 0.08 minus 0 0.08 or something. Okay. Then you'll get things that might be less oscillatory. They'll tend to also be slower. Okay. So we'll talk, we'll talk more about that. But anyway, so this gives you some example of these kind of interactions. I don't have this plugged in. All right, how many more slides do I have? Because I really want to finish on time because I just want to. Because I can't get any further behind, right? Because we have no time to make it up. Okay, so this is the mother of all characteristic equations. This is derived in the book. I, sp I spared you the horror of this. But let's say I d wanted to do the following. Okay. I wanted to determine what is the closed loop, right? So this is a closed loop system. This system assumes you're using U1 to control Y1 and U2 to control Y2. And now I want to find the closed loop transfer function between Y1 and this set point and Y2 and this set point. That's what we did, right? Closed loop transfer function. You find the transfer functions between the output and the set points and maybe also disturbances if you have them. I didn't. We're not talking about those right now. All right, so the problem here is that guess what? Y1 not only depends on this set point, but it also is going to end up depending on that set point, unfortunately, because of these interactions. And Y2 will depend on that as desired, but unfortunately also on that. So to do this, you do the same thing you've, you've done before, but remember the magic formula I gave you? The pi, what is it? Well, pi F over 1 plus pi E. I don't, I don't actually myself know how to apply this, probably because I've never tried to derive the result I'm about to show you. But it suffices to say, at a minimum, you could just write all the algebraic equations here and eliminate them such that the only th you only had y1, y2, and the two set points. And if you did <coughs> do that, which I wouldn't ask you to do, so don't panic, um, you would end up with something that looks like this. Okay. So when you're when it's all said and done, you would find that y1 depends on both of the set points, the one you want it to and the one you don't want it to, and the same thing for y2. Depends on this set point, good. That set point, not good, but unavoidable. Okay. And so at this, so I'm, I've just summarized what's in the book. So now I'm telling you each of these transfer functions, which is that a gamma or a lambda? Yeah. That's a gamma, capital gamma, okay. So each of these gammas has some numerator that I don't care about at this point, but they all have, as you might expect, the same denominator. Okay, every one of those transfer functions, all four of them, one, two, three, four, and the, tr and the denominator looks like that. Why do we care about the denominator? Because the denominator determines whether the system is stable, right? It's the characteristic equation. The roots of it determine if the system is stable, if it can oscillate, if it has overshoot, all the things that we normally have. It's a, it's a beast, this thing, right? If you, <laughs> if you look at this. Involves the control. Each of the controller transfer functions, both there and there, it involves all four of those process transfer functions: the two that you design the controllers based on, and also the other two that you neglected. And it's it's uh, it's messy. <coughs> okay. So if you wanted to analyze the stability of close that closed-up system I showed you, you'd have to deal with this characteristic equation here. So if I said find the roots of the characteristic equation, I would have to give you. Or let me, I could give you this problem if I wanted to. I did this once on a test. I won't do it to you guys though. This is, this is what's called the intimidation factor. Okay. I gave this problem and I said, find the range of controller gains KC1 and KC2 that make the system stable. So I gave all four transfer functions, plug them in, get a characteristic equation involving KC1, K2, get, do Ruth, get these ranges. It's pretty messy. Okay. But it can be done. The main thing to convince you here is that the stability of the system depends b on both controllers and in some complex way. It's hard to, it's not easy to design the controls to guarantee this is going to work. Okay. <coughs> so if you're lucky and either one of these off diagonal transfer functions that you neglect when you do the design is zero, then this term here will be zero. Okay. And that means you'll have this thing, the characteristic equation will be this thing, I should have wrote equals zero. Right, because that whole term will drop out. So, 
Let me, let me see if you believe this. Here's my claim that, um, so there's going to be, so if we look at like, let's say the, the roots of this, right? Well, the, the closed loop, that'll be the closed loop poles, determine stability, everything else. If you have a form that looks like this, then the roots are going to be whatever the roots are of this part plus whatever the roots are for that part, right? Because, I mean, it's pretty clear when you factor this in, you're going to have this polynomial and this polynomial. If either one equals zero, that'll be fine. So you'll have this equals zero and this equals zero. You can do it separately, okay? Now, if you look at this equation here, this is, this is going to be the characteristic polynomial that you're going to use to design this controller in the first place because it only involves the GP1 and this. So, and this one only involves GP2, which you'll use to design this <laughs> controller. So these, these things should be okay because if they're not, you did a bad design of GC1 and GC2 by themselves. So, I mean, the, the reasoning here is if you can't expect two controllers to work well together if they don't work well by themselves, right? You might have the opposite problem. They work well by themselves, but they don't work well together. But certainly we can design one controller to place the poles where we want and another controller to do it. And it, so you can design these two controllers independently. And if this is the case, this term's not here because one of these is zero. The two controllers are guaranteed to work if you put them together. Okay, because the closed loop poles are nothing but the ones you designed for. So that corresponds to the situation which I mentioned earlier, and that's where, wrong way. This path here that um, torments us, if you will, doesn't exist, right? Because if either one of these transfer functions is zero, then this whole circuitous thing is not there and you're, you're fine, okay? All right. Now here's a, here's a pathological example. You, ever, you know what a pathological example is? It's like where someone picks an example to make their point in the most extreme way, but it's extremely rare that you would encounter something as bizarre as they've chosen. Okay? That's why they're fun. All right? So someone picked this example in the book. I don't know where they got it from. I know the guys that wrote this book, they're not smart enough to do this themselves. Okay? So they got it from somewhere else. All right. Um, all right. So here's our transfer function matrix, right? So I'm just giving it to you. This is the four transfer functions, right? It relates the two outputs over here to the two inputs over here, okay? Here are the two controllers, okay? I'm, gonna, I'm telling you at this point, let's just pick both controllers to be proportional controllers. And my goal is to determine when these gains will make the system stable. What combination of KC1 and KC2 will make the system stable? And to do this, I have to use this characteristic equation here, right? So in principle, you can do the following, right? Plug in, you have all four of these transfer functions. There's GP11 and 12 and so on. You plug all those things in. You plug in the controller gain here. You get a big polynomial. I, I wrote this. It's going to look something like this. Okay, I took this out of the book, I think, because their thing was so complicated, I didn't want to <laughs> write it. But it's going to be a fourth order polynomial. Leading coefficient ends up being 100. You'll have coefficients that multiply s um, cubed, s squared, s1, s to the zero, and those will depend on the controller gains, okay? So if you wanted to, you know the, the story, if you wanted to, to determine what range of these gains are stable, you apply the Ruth method to this, okay? It, and it would get complicated, and this is the answer if you do that. It's not, I'm not, I'm not intending that you do this, I'm just trying to explain where this came from. So somebody did this and they found the range of which the controller gains are stable using Ruth or some other method. And this is why the, it's pathological. So you see only in the strip here is the system stable. So only the, the combination of controller gains in this white part is the system stable. All the hatch stuff is not stable. Okay. So this basically says if KC1 is large then KC2 better be small. If KC2 is large then KC1 better be small. Okay. But the, Let's just put it this way. This is not something you would know a priori, right? I mean, this is not something you would figure out without doing this kind of detailed analysis. So this is, this is problematic, right? That's, this, you're not liable to see examples this, this bad, but maybe, I don't know. But you can imagine that you would design controller gains for each controller individually that wouldn't be in this range. Because you don't, this is not a, 
you know, this is not a problem until you turn both controllers on at a time. So if you design each controller independently, there's no reason to believe the gains are going to be in that range. That means when you turn them on together, the system will not only perform poorly, <coughs> right? This is performing poorly. Oscillate, but stable. In this case, perform poorly, go on, go on completely unstable. Okay? So I'll show, you, I'll show you that in a minute. Okay? All right, so I put together a, a little example here to show how you go about doing this. So it's the same, ex it's the same exact example. Okay, I'm going to show you what happens in Simulink if you do this. So here's my transfer function matrix. I'm going to do this design. Okay, I'm going to pair U1 and Y1 together and U2 and Y2 together. I'm going to design both controllers using IMC method that we talked about. And remember for the IMC method you need a closed loop time constant. I'm going to pick 5. Okay, why do I pick 5? Because if you look at the controller, so what I'm going to design the first controller with that transfer function, the second controller with that one. They both have closed loop time constants of 10. Okay, and therefore a reasonable open loop time, I'm sorry, closed loop time constants one half that value. That's why I picked five here. Okay. All right. So first of all, to design the first controller, which is the one that uses U1 to control Y1, I use this transfer function. It's called GP11. It's just that there. It's first order, right? So if you go into the table, and I think it's table 12.1 in the book, You'll see if you have a first order transfer function that looks like that, you'll end up with the IMC method or direct synthesis, same thing, getting a PI controller and these are the tuning formulas taken directly out of the book. That's all. Just took them directly out of the book. It says take the controller gain to be 1 over the process gain and then take the ratio of the open loop gain to your closed loop gain. Okay, and I've just plugged in the values. 2 for the gain, 10 for the time constant, 5 for the closed loop time constant, you get, it ends up being 1. Okay, and it says take the um, integral time of your controller just to be equal to the open loop time constant, which is 10. So I'm just, just applying, there's a lot of subscripts here, right? But it, I'm just applying the formula directly out of the book. Now I do the same thing for the other controller. It's also first, in fact, it's the exact same transfer function. So in a miracle of modern science, we get the exact same tuning parameters, okay? So, th so it says the controller for U1, Y1 is a PI controller with that gain and that integral time, and the second controller is, has the exact same tuning, okay? So my goal is to evaluate if this works using Simulink. I already know that I, have, I, I should be afraid, potentially very afraid, because I know this is true, right? I know it's not, there's a good chance it may not fall in this range, things may not work out for me. So let's see. So I built this mother of all Simulink block diagrams. Okay. So it's just a representation of what we already have seen, but so I have Y1 here, I take it, I compare it to my set point, generate an error signal, I have my PID controller, which is the one I just designed. It's gonna send an input through this transfer function and attempt to control Y1. Okay. So, right, I designed this controller using that transfer function. I have the same thing down here, similar thing. Take Y2, compare it to the set point, generate error signal. This controller operates on it, sends a signal through this transfer function to try to control Y2. And I designed that controller based on that transfer function, on, just on the previous page. But I also have to account for the fact that U1 not only affects Y1 through this transfer function, it also affects Y2 through this transfer function, and U2 affects, U2 affects Y2 through this one, but also Y1 through that one. Okay, so it just looks just like the blight diagram. You can see I've written lots of stuff to the workspace, both set points, both inputs, both outputs. Okay? And these are the tra four transfer functions that were in that matrix. This is G11, 12, 2, 1, 2, 2. Okay. And then the output Y1 here is just the sum of the effect of Y1, sorry, U1 through this transfer function and U2 through that one. So it just looks just like the diagram I showed you earlier, just for a particular example. Uh, so I entered my PID tuning parameters here and here um, that I just designed on the previous page. And so what have I done here? Well. This, sh this is a case where I've um, 
design I'm testing each controller individually right I've designed both of these controllers so they're supposed to work by themselves so what I'm going to do is for example I'm going to turn this controller off how do you turn this controller off you go in you click on here and you enter a game right this <coughs> this wants the controller to look like this it tells you at least the version I'm using Right. It likes you to write the controller transfer function like this, the proportional part plus the integral part plus the derivative part. So, you know, we've been through this before. So if you want to turn the controller off, first of all, we, this is going to be zero generically because we don't have a derivative part, we only have PI. If you want to control it, if I want to turn this controller off to test this one by itself, I simply click this thing and turn P and I to zero. That'll turn that controller off. Okay, so that's what I did. And if I want to test this controller, then I come up here and I tur turn the P and I to this one to zero. It doesn't matter which one I test because they're going to behave exactly the same because they're exactly the same controller controlling exactly the same process. So if you, if you do that and then you see how they work, you say, oh, it looks good. Not surprisingly. So I've, I've tested it for a set point change. This could be either controller. They're just the same. But if this is the set point change, for example, for Y1, change it at 5. Here's the actual Y1 changing. Looks nice. You could speed it up maybe a little bit, but looks good. Right? Here's the corresponding input. Looks fine. Right? We always say we make sure the input doesn't do something too crazy, like go way up and way down. And it looks good. So it works by itself. No surprises. If it didn't work by itself, then we did something terribly wrong. Okay? And so then we say, well, let's turn them both on and see what happens. Uh-oh. All right. So you can't even see what's happened here because the scale is so large. So these are both, so this is the output 1 and output 2, and that's input 1 and input 2. And what I've done here is, you can't see it because look at the scale, it's huge, but I've done a set point change in one of these things or both these things. I don't think it makes any difference. And so you can, you can see over a period of time, eventually this, this system goes com completely unstable. Okay. So my guess is I'd have to run it. Usually when I run thing, things go wrong, but I could give it a shot because we got a little time. Is that it looks okay for a while, okay? But eventually it, it, um, it goes unstable. Right, and this would, be a, this would be a problem. This would be a big problem if you were in a plant or something and this were to happen. So let me see if I can uh, open this thing up real quick. I wonder what this thing is called. Oh, there it is. <coughs> Sounds like people are getting sick. Class is over, okay, because I don't want to get sick. All right, so you can, you can barely see this monster here. Um, it's the same thing I pasted on there. So, for example, let me, let me just check these guys out. 1 and point 0.1, I guess that's okay. 1 and point 0.1. So, for example, if I wanted and 2, let me see what this thing is. Good. This thing. Okay, I'm not changing that at all. So again, if you wanted to test one controller at a time, you would just come in here and just change these values to zero. Oops. And then in principle, I could run this thing. And then I got some stuff in my workspace, so I could plot, for example, um, T out and Y1 and T out and okay that's that's just that's just what I showed you right set point change at time five goes up there looks great no problem um, so now just real quick if I turn them both on what were these numbers again one and point one yeah? I don't actually trust you. Okay. 
So this probably works short term. Let's see. <coughs> well, maybe not. Is that 50? Oh, yeah. Okay. I thought it was a longer time scale. So anyway, you can't even see what it's doing initially. It might, might be looking okay up here. I'm going to have to... Let's just check it out. You know this command, right? Access, it's called. So I don't know, 0 to 15 and, oops. <coughs> What's it? So it's 0 to 1, so maybe 0 to 1.5 or something like that. <coughs> That's weird. I guess it didn't. Where'd my output go? <laughs> I see my set point. Strange. <coughs> Why does life never work for me? <laughs> I'm trying to change the axis to see if least of it worked originally. And I see a little blue thing here. But I don't <laughs> I don't know what I don't know where my line went. Okay. So I've got a new solution. Right. Oh, I see, because it went the wrong direction right away. Duh. Sorry. So, okay, so you can see it, it's, it's bad from the very beginning. <laughs> so, right, as long as there's no perturbation at all, you're already a steady state, was okay, but as soon as I did the set point change, it just took off in the opposite direction, unstable. Okay. Now, who wants to see the following buffoonery? Tell me if you're interested. Um, yes. I will attempt to, to, to make this system stable by making the gain a factor of 10 smaller. I wonder if this will work. If it doesn't work, we're done. And if it does work, we're done. I know. <coughs> I know. <laughs> I failed. OK, get out of here. <laughs> 